वेलकम फ्रेंड्स टू सी एन एस सीरीज ऑफ इंटरव्यूज फ्राम द थर्ड एशिया पेसिफिक फेमिनिस्ट फोरम और ए पी एफ एफ टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन विच इज़ बिंग हेल्ड इन चेंग माई थाईलैंड ए पी एफ एफ टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन इज़ ऑर्गेनाइज बाई द एशिया पेसिफिक फोरम ऑन वेमेन लॉ एंड डेवलपमेंट और ए पी डब्ल्यू एल डी टूडे वी हैव विद अस थिया गेल्समैन फ्राम ई एस सी आर नेट दैट इज़ एन इंटरनेशनल नेटवर्क फॉर इकोनॉमिक सोशल एंड कल्चरल राइट्स वी हैव निकी गमारा from defend job from philippines defend job values dignity of work as recognition and respect for the dignity of every human person and last but not the least we have with us pauline water from haki jami that supports community based social rights advocacy of kenya uh, well apff 2017 has been very important in that it looked at women's rights in relation to land rights housing and natural resources I will request each one of you to please share what these very important linkages between women rights, housing and land rights and natural resources mean to you in your local context or the work you do. So can we start with Pauline? Um thank you very much uh, Shoba and the team. Um I'll speak about Uh, women land natural resources housing rights in Kenya i come from an organization called haki jami economic and social rights center and uh, we try to integrate women rights issues in economic and social rights it is not a very easy path to follow and uh, i remember at some point uh, one person asked me why we do uh, women's rights they prefer human rights because human rights are for both men and women and women rights are for women only and so that portrays also that people think that human rights are uh, rights in isolation and not um, human rights at large and that some certain uh, number of people are pushing for feminism and pushing men out of the way but back to uh, land and uh, natural resources rights in Kenya We've made a lot of progress, I must say. Um, I think the government has heeded to the call from uh, international bodies like the Committee on Economic Social Rights, uh, CEDO, and um, the African Commission. And we have quite a number of progressive laws in the country. Uh, we have our constitution, and in fact, our constitution um, has a two third uh, gender rule for women in parliament we have not attained that but i think uh, the spirit of the constitution is very clear uh, in that uh, women are a key part of uh, political uh, participation and uh, also uh, they are a key part of uh, decision making in kenya because two thirds is not just for parliament but for institutions as well and one of the institution that is key is the land administration bodies in that you find for a very long time men have been uh, uh, the ones that make decisions in these bodies and yet women are the ones that have uh, property women are the w- women are the ones who farm every day and i remember there's one time we did a field visit and um, we found a farm uh, where women were busy cultivating and just 100 meters away was a small shack and the men were there drinking i won't say where it was but it was quite devastating that women can you know uh, be going to cultivate and yet at the end of the day they do not make any income from it or the income they make comes back to their family and somebody drinks it away so again you find some of these issues might not be uh, addressed by law and policy per se but also by norms what do we do uh, every day with our women uh, what uh, is our culture like and i may say not all culture is bad i know people say uh, uh, this and this is not acceptable internationally but we have tried to um, uh, bring in culture to our constitution that culture that is good culture that is not uh, repugnant to article 2 of the constitution of kenya and uh, also in terms of uh, you know women uh, right to housing and especially in urban informal settlements where we work as well you know it's not just about you know the four walls but again uh, sanitation issues and i remember there's a time we had uh, a forum uh, in an informal settlement called mukuru and 
you know, three women just rose up and said that, you know, sanitation is an issue not because, uh, um, you know, they cannot uh, afford, but there's no space. And so they're forced to go outside at night, and that means insecurity for them. It also means that you know they have to do what they, whatever they have to do uh, in the same room at night. You can imagine doing that and not being able to to uh, to dispose that off. So again, you find uh, these are uh, very very uh, real issues. Then again, when you come to you know uh, uh, the land rights uh, for women, and in particular there are mega projects going on. And we had two projects in Lamu, where you know the Lamu uh, Port Southern Sudan uh, Ethiopian Transport Corridor. It's a mega uh, project with uh, three East African countries, and it it's uh, billions of dollars, uh, you know. And you can imagine that's a trillion of uh, Kenya shilling, more than our budget, I think, for three four years, just one project. And women, uh, and especially uh, the widowed women and the Muslim women, because that project passes across the Northern Corridor, which has been marginalized for a long time. Uh, some of them could not get compensation, either because they are widowed and uh, their um, uh, brothers-in-laws or you know father-in-law uh, took the money for the compensation from the government. Uh, some of the women uh, who are telling us their stories is that they were not informed that in fact a project is going on. And so that brings me back to the awareness issue. You know, we might take it for granted that me and you know things, but most women, especially in the rural areas, do not know uh, what is going on. Uh, their literacy levels also is down because some of these areas women are not uh, appreciated, they're not taken to schools. It's, it's the men who get to do that, and women are told to stay at home. And again, I went to a community in Garissa, and I found one of our, uh, our community members, and I found a few girls in that, in that uh, uh, community, and it, I remember it was a school day, and they told me, no, the mother, actually the mother said, no, let this kid not go to school, the woman, the, I mean the girl child, she needs to help me at home. And, you know, I was taken aback because I thought that's something that we are past in Kenya, that, you know, women can now uh, go to school, the girl child can go to school, and it's not questionable. But you find some parts of the country, and I'm sure some parts of Asia, and, you know, some parts of the world still, you know, uh, women don't have enough literacy levels and we need to empower them and even in you know such forums like the Asia Pacific I think it should not just be for the elite women but for the rural women the women who have not had such opportunities because I keep asking myself yes we fight for the rights of women but is it for the urban woman is it for the rural woman who has no opportunities I mean who do we speak for at the end of it all you know, we form NGOs and say rights for the women, uh, women rights to land, women rights to housing. But you find again, when you go to the ground, most women don't have access to these things. So it's good also to measure what it is that you're doing as, as a civil society. Who are we speaking for? I think it's important that everyone gets their voice uh, to advocate for their own issues. So in the context of the Philippines, um, women's rights is very much integral with uh, uh, land rights, housing rights, and the right to access to the natural resources. Um, as the indigenous people, or we call them Lumad of Mindanao, the southernmost island of the Philippines, put it, land is life for them. Um, it's, it's the same for both we, uh, women in the rural areas and also in the urban areas because um, farmers or peasant, women peasants or farmers are um, find their empowerment, find their roles in our society through participating in, in the economic activities of the family, especially in farming, in, in tilling the land where they live, um, even for the indigenous women. So, uh, but then, um, in the current situation in our country, there's still um, um, more or majority of, of the peasants, especially women peasants, do, do not have, uh, do not own the lands that they till. So um, this affects their, their, their 
space to perform and claim their role in their family and in their in the society and it's the same very much the same in the urban context uh, uh, or in the urban areas which are my organization the fan job is is focused on um, um, women's the women's uh, women's rights are not are not um, are not claimed and protected uh, in the course of uh, or in relation to their to their um, rights to housing to adequate housing and like uh, because right now um, people not only the women uh, most of the poor people are being thrown out of the cities or of the urban areas because it's being um, um, delegated for the conduct of business of finance of big mega development projects and it doesn't only um, take and it doesn't only mean that you take them away from their space you take away th their homes you take the you, they take away their livelihood um, and this livelihood are improvised livelihoods livelihoods that they thought of uh, creatively so that they could augment the meager wages that they most of the time their husbands are earning from the um, small factories around their areas so you basically take away their life when you take away their right to housing and it's very much evident and rampant right now in the Philippines because of this like what I said the, the mega development projects that is being implemented for the so-called development of these communities but then again you won't we don't see where is the where is a woman, where is the mother, where is the child, where is the daughter standing in <laughs> in the midst of this development that they said that they are saying, and and with that said, that also put us our interest of defending our rights as women, right to rights are, as women in the middle of the overall fight for of the people for for the cities right for adequate housing fight for our land fight for the resources fight for uh for the right that we decide on what we should do with our resources what we should do with the land that that we till we should do what with the space that we now occupy uh, because um uh this rights no, women's rights and all of these things are very much related and very much connected uh, and you cannot we believe that you cannot really enjoy one without having the other you cannot really um, say that uh, we are we are empowering ourselves as women if we always would um, worry about our houses being torn down by 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 big corporations or by the government to, to pave way for for these projects we cannot really say that we we will we are empowered when we would always worry if of course there would be no opportunity for us to to eat to sleep well to have peace of mind for not only for ourselves but more so because right still in right now uh, the burden of taking care of the family is still on the mostly on the women so and it's being much more of a burden when you have to worry all these things in the midst uh, of uh, yes uh, nikki and actually i would like to add something from the indian perspective and maybe it's true elsewhere when we are talking of defending jobs uh, women those who are in jobs they have they have to face a double burden mm -hmm. uh, the patriarchal system which exists at home uh, there are many instances in India and maybe elsewhere also where after marriage the woman has to opt for a softer job softer mm -hmm. which entails maybe lesser working hours so she can look after the family so it's not her decision the choice is not left to her very often and I'm talking of the urban women who are in uh, the so-called good jobs or high paying jobs uh, very often uh, the purse strings are managed by the husband the earnings of the wife, even her bank account, sometimes the passbook is with the husband and the husband knows everything and has, you have to take the husband's permission or the permission of the others to be able to spend uh, anything mm -hmm. on your own. Then when the woman becomes a mother, 
uh, we have all this promotion of WHO says six months of exclusive breastfeeding. But unfortunately, the workplace does not support that. So either the woman resigns from the job or she starts feeling guilty that she's not able to breastfeed the child f exclusively for six months. Mm -hmm. So there are too many contradictions and we need to connect those yes. dots, I think. That is very important. And Pauline, you talked about that uh, the mother trying to withdraw the girl from school. We have many such cases in India. Very recently, two years back, I was talking to a mother. Her daughter was suffering from multi-drug resistant TB and was hospitalized. So the mother was in the hospital all the time. And she said that my other daughter, I have taken her out of the school to look after the family. She had a son also. So I just asked her um, that, uh, what about your son? She said, no, of course, I can't take him out of school. That is impossible. And what will he do? He can't do the household work. So one daughter getting sick, for that, another daughter is pulled out of school. So, so these are the injustices which may be at a very local level or in, within the family mm -hmm. because of that um, male-dominated society and patriarchal setup mm -hmm. which, which we are uh, suffering every day. Okay, now So um, ESCRNet is made up of approximately 300 members, m most of them organizational members in almost 80 countries around the world. And it's remarkable to note that almost half of the members of our network are in some way working on human rights in the context of land, housing, or natural resources. You have to wonder, why is this such a prevalent theme in the field of economic, social, and cultural rights today? Um, and I, I would say that our members have been working on these issues from multiple different starting points over a number of years now. Um, one thing that's become apparent when you look across countries and regions and across very diverse contexts is that um, issues of land and natural resources are really issues of power. Um, those who control those lands and resources are the ones that control political power in society. They are often the ones that control um, cultural norms and are able to set standards in the terms of societal relationships. Um, and there's also a place where economic power is very much expressed. Um, in my experience, we've seen in multiple different contexts that um, contestation over land and natural resources in particular um, is also a place where um, very different paradigms around development are playing out. Um, on the one hand, you see this prevalence of, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, mega projects, large um, f investments, often from multi you know, multinational sources, um, into certain areas to generate profit, often in the name of development, um, and in ways that involve massive amounts of land and compromise uh, ecosystems and environments, and of course, with that, the livelihoods of people that live very close to those lands and natural resources. Um, that's a model of development that very much privileges the economic uh, component of land tenure and recognizes land and the natural resources contained there primarily as a commodity and as a means to generate profit, right? On the other hand, um, uh, as mentioned by, by also by some of our members, land for other people is really a place where their culture and identity is expressed and has been developed, right? Um, indigenous peoples in very, very many parts of the world often use the term territory instead of land to distinguish from uh, more of an individual property focus of land to really emphasize the more collective nature of their relationship with their space. Their space is, a, yes, as a place to sustain their livelihoods, but also as a place to develop their cultural identity, where their ancestral knowledge is held, um, and where their sense of their selves as people is really perpetuated over time. So we've seen across the world a number of conflicts that are breaking out as there's a clash of different patterns around land tenure, who gets to control and access those lands. I would say in the context of housing, we're seeing very similar struggles taking place. Whereas for, for example, major real estate developer, developers will see a piece of urban land as a place to generate profit. Whereas for, for low income people that live on that land, that's their home and that's their, that's their place of belonging. I think when you look at this from the perspective of women's rights in particular, you also see that land and housing is a place where the power dynamics inherent in gender relations also plays out. 
And as mentioned um, previously, you see this very clearly in cases when land is taken away. We often call that land grabbing. Um, when populations are displaced or evicted because other more powerful forces have other designs on their land or space there. When you have a sense of who are recognized as stakeholders in those processes, who gets to claim any benefits that might be derived from the developments that take place there, or compensation that is awarded when those lands are effectively taken away and there's some acknowledgement of local damages. Um, and you know, one of the things that we've also realized is that while the international human rights framework does address um, many rights issues as it relates to land, there is currently no freestanding human right to land that exists in the international system. And therefore, it's a real challenge, I think, for international human rights advocates to be looking at multiple different instruments and mechanisms that we could use, whether from the perspective of adequate housing, or human right to food, and um, over time, we're seeing more arguments as well about um, land, housing, and natural resources as a component of the basic right to life. Um, and so within our network, I think we're trying to generate more and more substantive arguments and ideally jurisprudence going forward to help substantiate the claims of people whose lives are intrinsically connected with their land as their homes, as their base for their culture, uh, identity, and, and livelihoods. Um, and hopefully um, we are going to be seeing a, a, a counter push um, against this prevailing uh, development model that is so privileging the, the commodification of land and a greater recognition always of, the, of the, the component that's related to human dignity. So how do we change this and how do we shift this uh, rather skewed up power? How do we make it, make it a more balanced power so that the majority of landless people, and especially in relation to women, mm -hmm. I would feel, or those who are suffering from the brunt of plundering of natural resources, get justice, get housing, basic land rights, and their rights over natural resources. What is the way forward? Um, I, I think uh, there is no really right or wrong answer, uh, because it depends in the context in which mm -hmm this question has been asked. Uh, for me, my answer would be maybe we need a policy solution. In Philippines, maybe it would be uh, you know mass action. In uh, maybe New York, it would be let's come up with another international instrument to protect those rights. Uh, but I think from uh, where I come from is, again, going back to the basics, awareness, right? And I remember. Uh, uh, I was speaking uh, to a close uh, relative of mine who had lost the husband. And the first question she asked me is that, uh, how do I get my husband's property? And for me and you, we'd assume that uh, all property is uh, are registered between a man and a woman. So uh, that is very basic awareness of, of what should happen. Men, women should register uh, their property together to protect women from eviction when you know spouses die, which is very common in Kenya. Uh, but again, also it's creating that uh, uh, will within uh, the political class for rights like housing and land rights to be uh, to be protected. Evictions happen politically, and that I have seen in Nairobi. It's always a political question that uh, this very prime piece of land in the middle of town does not have a title deed, so everyone feels they're entitled to it. Uh, one thing they forget is that uh, the population th there's a population living there that is uh, very poor and they cannot afford to go somewhere else, and that's the least of the problem. So just that political will, you know, to find uh, governors who understand issues of uh, of how housing and uh, also housing the urban population which I know is quite a big task for especially developing countries like ours you know uh, providing adequate housing is something that uh, needs to be progressive but it has to be seen to be progressive you know that is the argument that most governments use that you know it's progressive and this year we did something so tiny and next year we'll do tiny again I think it should be measurable for us actors we need to have like indicators how do you measure that the government is addressing economic and social rights and these rights are also new to Kenya how do we ensure people know that they actually have a right to adequate housing and reasonable standards of sanitation and that rights that go beyond the Constitution because that's a question that I'm asked every day by uh, by people so yes now Pauline you've told me I have a right to housing then I'm still living in an informal settlement what does that help me with 
again, you know, just changing that mentality that people have the power to bring change. Of course, I very much agree with Pauline that we, um, it is very important to raise the awareness of our people. In the Philippines, we, we, we used to say we must arouse, organize, and mobilize our fellow, Pino, fellow Filipino people. We start with education, of course, among uh, those who are really affected, among the public who has to support, who has, whom support we have to gather for the whatever issue that we are working on. And, and but more importantly, organize ourselves because um, it, we could only make use of whatever that we, we are learning through education. We could only make use of the awareness uh, raising among our, our fellow Filip Filipino people when we, are, when we get to organize and make collective actions. Um, even if it will be little by little, step by step, but then if it's calibrated and it's being done in a in a very organized and systematic way, I think we could reach our goals. Um, and uh, also uh, in this time that uh, the economic actors or some in or some of the time or sometimes even governments are the ones involved in in uh, let's say eviction or or land grabbing uh, or or extractive um, industry um, grabbing the, the lands or territories of indigenous people we must also um, strengthen our links to other peoples around the world or where is this um, company or corporation or government is based you know we have to strengthen our links with the others who are experiencing the same because it's I think I think from what we've shared and from what I've heard in the past few days in this in this forum there is really a very much like uh, there is really a trend ongoing and and our experiences is not that different from from the other countries it may take different shapes but then it's still the same and therefore that only calls for or for building stronger linkages within uh, among among uh, uh, peoples around uh, the world. I totally agree with uh, Nikki and Pauline I'd just like to add that uh, yes raising awareness is important because of course policy changes are important having proper laws in place are important and the next important thing is implementation of mm -hmm. those laws very often we have some very good laws about which particularly women are not aware of mm -hmm. or they are emotionally blackmailed into not following that mm -hmm. law even if uh, in India we have a law for uh, uh, inheritance rights uh, equal for women uh, and men uh, but uh, most of the time either the women are not aware or even if those who are aware it doesn't come easily it doesn't come naturally to them uh, that they become part of that inheritance and if they want to fight uh, well then they are the odd ones out in society and they are the family breakers and uh, and that brings me to that word the uh, homemaker we very often we call women homemaker what what does that mean others are home breakers or what <laughs> those who work outside connected to job <laughs> So I think that is important and, the, and that is why that awareness and changing of mindset that exercise the rights, at least the rights which are there, we need to be strong enough to exercise them and then of course bring policy change, that is important. Uh, yes, Thea, now the global perspective. You know, in, in my experience, it seems that whether from the perspective of policy change or more from the direct action of people whose lives are immediately affected by these issues, um, we really need to see a much greater level of accountability in the way that decisions are made around land, housing, and natural resources. I think the process by which those decisions are made and then implemented um, contains a lot of richness there that may um, suggest to us a way forward in terms of some positive social change in this arena. Um, one of the areas that I believe really merits further attention is the question of what assumptions are underlying those decisions that are being made and who is being held accountable. Um, for example, is there an assumption that a national government can speak on behalf of a community 
who lives in a certain p plot of land to negotiate deals around that land with foreign investors and others? Does the foreign investor or the government have an obligation to consult those people and meaningfully take into consideration their perspectives, demands, and requirements in informing any of the decisions that are going to eventually take place around those lands? Um, I think another real question to look into there is the process through which that conversation even happens. In some parts of the world, you'll see through different cultural traditions that there are actually different political processes in place. In some communities, there's a leader, and that leader is, a, is a authorized to make decisions on behalf of their whole community. And if that leader is persuaded that it's in the community's interest to transfer land, they can sign on the line and they can authorize such a transfer. But in other communities, there needs to be a much more collective process in place. And if there isn't a recognition of those kind of political systems that are very much homegrown and local, um, human rights violations will easily occur. I think another set of assumptions that are very problematic is who speaks on behalf of families. And one of the things that's come up very strongly here in this feminist forum is questioning the role of men as head of households, as the sole one that gets to decide what the, what the interests are of the wider family. Um, in that regard, um, you know, one of, the, one of the areas that a lot of our members have been looking at is something that's really been moved forward since um, the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2007, where there was for the first time established, um, and this was in the case specifically for Indigenous peoples, the right to free, prior, and informed consent mm -hmm. before decisions are made that affect their land. We've seen in different parts of the world that there's some legislation or other mechanisms in place that somehow reflect that general logic in terms of consultative rights and rights for meaningful participation for affected communities. Um, a lot of our members are working with groups that would not self-identify as indigenous but are similarly advocating for meaningful participation from the communities whose lives are directed affe directly affected by those lands and accountability over that very process that leads to the decisions being made. And I will um, underscore again that um, for many people land is not primarily about profit. It's not primarily about economic asset or even a means of production, right? It's a place of living. It's a place where community is built and sustained. And it's a place where a sense of personal and also collective identity is maintained. Um, perhaps the last thing just to emphasize here is that you know, the reason that we keep emphasizing human rights as a tool or a framework to be dealing with these issues is not because human rights is somehow some God-given framework that's in, untouchable. It is also not a set of norms that have been bestowed upon us by states or by other benevolent power holders. Human rights have been born out of struggle by people whose lives are directly affected by human rights violations. And when you really stop and listen to the experience and analysis of people whose, whose lives are at the center of these problems, um, there's a lot of wisdom there. And there's, it's not a coincidence that, that struggles over land, over waters, over forests, over ecosystems, and over housing galvanizes millions of people around the world. I mean, this is just a, a, a tremendously meaningful issue for so many people and a very primal human level. Um, and so this is personal. This is not just an abstract academic or theoretical conversation. This is about people's yes. basic lives and about the form of development that we're trying to pursue and who gets to decide. Uh, Thea, do you see hope in the possible UN treaty to hold corporations accountable for not only plundering natural resources, but also depriving communities and violating their economic, social, and cultural rights. And what other mechanisms exist to make polluters pay? Yes, indeed. Currently underway um, in the United Nations system, we are witnessing a process by which a treaty is being developed to try to establish some standards over um, the human rights uh, responsibilities of business um, action. Um, the treaty is not only looking at directly the obligations of businesses, but also of member states of the UN system to be regulating the conduct of businesses. Uh, an important dimension of this treaty process is the recognition of what we call extraterritorial obligations, or the obligations of the, the, the states or the countries that um, home, that house the, the headquarters of transnational corporations that might be operating in other parts of the world. Um, I do suggest that this treaty, um, when it does get finalized and enters into force, will um, 
hopefully introduce a real substantive shift in the conversation around business activity. Um, primarily because I think there's a real re recognition here about the, ne the, the need for there to be, first of all, stronger regulation on business actors, as well as the obligation to provide remedy when damages do occur. Um, how hopeful we are about this becoming a really meaningful mechanism for change, I think that depends on how effectively um, we are all able to mobilize inputs from civil society groups, from communities directly affected by corporate abuses, to make sure that those perspectives are really taken up and incorporated into the intergovernmental process. And that's why ESCRNet has been working together with multiple other um, organizations and networks around the world to be facilitating that process. Um, you know, um, at the same time, the United Nations is not set up to compel member states to stop doing things or to do certain things. And the UN system is also not um, ideally set up to be um, playing a role of uh, international police person over, you know, corporate conduct. However, um, a recognition from the, the countries of the world that certain standards exist that are non-negotiable that um, are responsive to the inherent rights of all human beings and their basic dignity would bring us a step forward. Because I think currently the debates around um, business activity and the impact that those have on smallholder communities, particularly poor um, communities and marginalized people, and very much on women of those, um, of those, of those communities, has been very subjectivized. You know, I think currently there's been a lot of assumptions that you know businesses are coming into an area that they're bringing benefits that wouldn't have come if they had not brought their investment there. That um, governments are 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 negotiating a strong role for businesses in providing access to essential services and playing core roles in development processes, um, because without that. Um, that capital, s there simply would not be the same level of, of investment in these social and development programs. I think we need to really qu safeguard the role of the state as the primary duty bearer for guaranteeing access to services, and we need to be ensuring that businesses are, are, are able to operate and play their rightful role in society, but that there's rules of the game that are set very firmly, um, and that also include the obligations of the countries of the world to be really managing um, their conduct and holding themselves accountable to the very people whose lives are affected by their operations. Thanks to all three of you for whipping up the anger, arousing hope, and suggesting the action, the way forward. Friends, you were listening to Thea of ESCR Net, Nikki of Defend Job Philippines, and Pauline Vata of Haki Jami of Kenya, with whom Citizen News Service was in conversation with at the Third Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017, which is organized by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD. I would like to mention here that Defend Job, Haki Jami, APWLD and CNS are all members of ESCR Net. For more details, be welcome to visit CNS at www.citizen-news.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.